you're late coming in, I've sent the link on to Ray in the green room, so uh, he'll be making his way over where it's daylight. We also got a good morning from uh, Orju in the UK. It's 7 a.m. and sunny, or was 7 a.m. and sunny 15 minutes ago. So, <laughs> hello everyone from around the world. Uh, it's it's still uh, middle of the night. Actually, it's my usual bedtime right about now, so I'm drinking coffee. <laughs> my computer is in a mystery time zone. What? It's 11.16 p.m. according to Pamela's clock. Oh, my computer is apparently in California right now. Mm. Okay, now it's in St. Louis. It happens. It happens. The turkey ate it. The turkey that ate St. Louis. You really need to watch that video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, that was that. That was from earlier when we had Seth Shostak on, because um, uh, one of his his uh, comrades in making silly short videos, uh, Bob O'Connell, was a uh, is a professor at UVA where I was, and so I get to learn all these things. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we'll do uh, one more station identification while we're waiting for Peter to join us. This is the CosmoQuest 32-hour Hangout-a-thon. Um, it was 24 hours, but we had so many people who expanded to 32. I prefer uh, to think that we're simply moving so fast that time has slowed down for us while it continues <laughs> to spin in the rest of the world. So yes, we have, we have grown by time dilation. Uh, and so that helps us out. <laughs> so we are doing this as a fundraiser uh, for uh, all the programs that we're doing through CosmoQuest. So if you like science, uh, astronomy, science education, uh, citizen science, um, be sure to share what we're doing. Uh, get more people involved in the projects and hopefully throw a few bucks our way to keep the project running. Uh, and we have been joined by Peter. Hey, can you hear me? <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> That's um, so hashtag no, I don't have glasses. A little, little ah. post-it note <laughs> that I, I just thought I'd stay you guys up. I thought you, you've been at this for hours now, so, so uh, yeah. That's awesome! Oh my goodness! <laughs> this, thank you, Peter. <laughs> That was brilliant. <laughs> so, so Peter is one of the folks behind iTelescope. He's been a friend of CosmoQuest since day one, and he is off doing great science right now at a science festival that I'm going to let you explain because you'll do a better job than I will. Unless he's frozen. Are you frozen? I think he's frozen. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh... If you can hear us, Try uh, Command R, Control R, depending on your operating system to reset your window. That often unfreezes. <laughs> oh no! We've been doing so well. We've only had one other tech fail, and that was uh, Kevin. Yeah, that was with Kevin. All right. Oh, so so oh. well. <laughs> Pop. <laughs> so I I've, I'm highly amused because we've started getting. These, these adorable tweets um, from people going to bed. <laughs> so, nice. Gary the Great, Star Strider at Noisy Astronomer, have to call it a night. Keep up the good work. You can do it. Uh, then we have um, from Conundrum192, before sleep takes me, thank you. Your CS work has changed my life. I am very appreciative. And we just got a Citizen Gold, got a jet. People are showing up to be social. He's on the day side of the planet right now. Actually meet people. <laughs> Catch you all in the morning. So oh, thank you, Citizen Gold. We, we, I had one of my favorite random moments with him. I, I got to go to Sydney for three days. Don't do that. Just don't. Um, but Sydney's fabulous. Do go to Sydney. Go for longer than three days if you're going from the middle of the United States. Um, but I was down there for a conference that was wedged between two other trips and I get there and I'm jet lagged and um, uh, it was the, the uh, just great humans that I've been friends with forever that, that picked, picked us up and um, we, we head out and um, we're getting lunch and, and I met Citizen Gold for the first time and we're chatting along, chatting along and my normal everyday speaking voice when I'm just chatting and I'm tired, my Texas accent from my dad pops through and from living in Texas. 
and it's not the podcaster voice people are used to. And especially if I'm trying to project my voice over a crowd, it's not the podcasting voice people are used to. And so we're talking, and he had no clue who I was, even though I'd introduced my name, because he was used to my voice. And we were tweeting and sharing Twitter handles, and I shared mine, and there was a sudden moment of, wait, you're who? And so it was just great that we had this long conversation, but we were two people that knew each other through Twitter from around the world. And then when we met face to face, we didn't know hey, each I'm other back. any longer. <laughs> hey, Peter, yay, we have you back. back. Sorry. Yeah, the uh, I'm not sure what happened. The uh, just as we cut across, I, I was in that green room for 20 minutes and it was working fine. And then for whatever reason, my laptop decided there was a stronger signal from my iPhone and killed the the hardwired um, broadband I had. And then it went to 3G. And we, as you can see, we're doing some some um, moon Whee! mapping here with with young Lucas and. Um, and Lucas was uh, on, so we had two computers going out through my iPhone at once, and it all crashed and burned. So, <laughs> like it does, just as you go live. So, so sorry about that. I'm, I'm just, I'm destroying your production quality here. So very, very <laughs> no, no. Now, oh, firstly, no. I must congratulate system. Nicole. I, I must congratulate Nicole because I believe she's graduated, and yes, uh, she's yes. now uh, got a doctor as well. So. This is the first time I've talked to you, so congratulations. I know that's a, a lot of work, a lot of hard work. And and so I had to drag out my best doctor-doctor joke, seeing how I've got two doctors in the same hangout, right? So, but we're not that kind of Do you have doctor-doctor doctor jokes in the U.S.? No. You don't have doctor... So I went to the doctor and I said, doctor-doctor, I think I'm a curtain. And he says, don't be silly, pull yourself together. <laughs> Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, awesome. I, I've never, never heard, heard these. So, no. Oh, I like it. So, so I had two doctors here today, so I thought I'd better um, drag out a doctor, doctor joke. So. Yes. Yeah, so, so um, you saw the pictures. I finally so got welcome. to walk. Oh, yeah, I finally got to walk at my graduation. Yeah. I graduated last August, but oh, I didn't. Very good. So I got my diploma, but then I couldn't actually walk until May because they do it once a year. So. Yeah. I got to do the funny hat thing, yeah, which so I guess welcome makes it even the, more official. Welcome to the laneways of Melbourne. Yay! <laughs> Hello, Melbourne. So, so tell us about this event that you're yeah, at right so, now. Um, so I've been. It's now um, 4:20 in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Um, so we've been here since 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, it took a little while to set up, but um, we've we've had my telescope online. Uh, we. Um, Took a few images of um, uh, a couple of nice galaxies for the folks here. We've uh, had um, we had it running for about an hour, but um, I'm not sure if you can see here. But um, the browser. I'm just going to go to the browser for a tick here. The um, the clouds just come in in New Mexico here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the roof has just closed, so so we're we're currently um, the roof is closed, so we're, we're not having much <laughs> luck. But we did manage to get um, 60 images of um, of um, asteroid um, 1998 uh, QE2 uh, before we did that. So um, we've been taking some asteroid images here. And we've been doing some moon mapping. We've been doing a lot of uh, really cool things. So it's been great. And and what I, what I love is it's broad daylight there. You started during yeah. broad daylight, and you just <laughs> said we just took images of galaxies. And yeah, so. this is one of the key things that you do with Eye Telescope is you make it possible to show people the sky while the sun is still up. So can you tell us yeah, a little well, bit about that? Well, it's in classroom time too for students, which is really great. So, one one of the things I did um, when was it? It was back in um, I think it was about October last year. I went into um, a year seven class at the school my kids go to because um, we've been doing a little bit of astronomy, and uh, the teachers were good enough to invite me into their space program for year nine level, and um, we went in and. Um, there was an alert from the AVSO about urgent data required for a for a um, 
uh, a mission on the Hubble Space Telescope. And this thing was only one hour above the horizon and the variable star had sort of, it had to be fainter than magnitude six. It was uh, a 17. cataclysmic variable and yeah, they could only yeah. observe it when it was in quiescence. Yeah, that's right. And and it had popped up from magnitude 18 to about magnitude 17.3 and they were worried it was going to go into outbursts. So, so the, an alert went out from the AV. So, and I went into the classroom and I said, guys, there's an emergency. The Hubble Space Telescope needs your data. So th there were other amateur astronomers. I think one other, uh, I think Mike Simonson from the AVSO was on it as well. But th these kids logged onto the telescope. Their eyes were as big as plates and they they uh, recorded the star, um, some images, and seven of the 13 data points used in the go, no, go decision that um, evening for the Hubble Space Telescope came from the classroom of Yarra Valley Grammar in Victoria. So <laughs> they were pumped. They were absolutely pumped. So it was really great. So they're controlling, so this is grade school kids controlling yeah. the Hubble Space Telescope. That's so cool. Yeah, well, so no, the, the mission controllers for the Hubble come out and have a go, no, go decision. Um, and part of the data that feeds into that decision is from the AAVSO. And seven out of, our, out of the 12 data points they made that decision on came from the year seven students at uh, my kid's school. So it was great. And, and this is an amazing example of how to be a citizen scientist, it's not like you have to be all grown up. Mm. You can be anyone who can be careful in your observations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the stuff we do with CosmoQuest, uh, we're not allowed to ask people's ages because of our research protocols, but when I go out into the public and do moon mappers, I've noticed that anyone shorter than about this tends to circle around the crater <laughs> instead of marking the edge of the crater, but once they're about bigger yeah, than yeah. this height, then they start to do it accurately. Um, yeah. So about fifth, sixth grade, we start to be able to get accurate crater measures. Oh. Yeah, so um, earlier this morning, we were doing a couple of um, presentations from the, um, we, we did a presentation from the OSIRIS-REx um, uh, mission. So iTelescope is now an official partner of OSIRIS-REx and I'm authorized by Osiris Rex to speak on behalf of the mission. So they sent after we've awesome. been working together a while. They sent me the the, the slide pack. So we we actually um, if I, I I won't go through it all, but it's been through. Um, Osiris Rex is a sample return mission that's going to asteroid uh, ben, Bennu, which has just yep. been named Bennu. Um, it's um, 101955. Um, 1999 RQ36 wow. and it's a sample return mission and we know about 500,000 asteroids um, but of those there, there are about um, 7,000 that approach the Earth. Um, they're trying to narrow them down to 300 that have orbits uh, that are suitable for a sample return. 27 of those have uh, diameters greater than 200 meters. Five are carbonaceous ones which uh, will be interesting asteroids and the one they've selected for this mission in 2016 is uh, asteroid Bennu. And um, as part of a citizen science program, a uh, boy in a year eight uh, wrote a, a little description on why it should be called Bennu. And I, I don't have the, the recall of that uh, immediately, but um, it's just recently. And it's quite interesting because, as you know, uingu has been running naming competitions and, and rubbing a few, uh, ruffling a few feathers with the uh, International Astronomy Union. Uh, but, but this was one in official NASA program where they had the right to name the asteroid whatever they decided. Um, and this asteroid, Bennu, um, you, you, listeners might be interested to know that it has a 1 in 1800 chance of hitting the Earth in the year 2182. So it's officially the most dangerous asteroid uh, by the NASA, well, the, all the programs, JPL and the Minor Planet Center have discovered so far. So it's quite a critical one that we understand the albedo, the rotation, the period, um, so that we can develop over the next 169 years um, uh, an idea of maybe what we might need to do way out in the future. So it's a very interesting asteroid. So when, one of the um, awesome things 
about citizen science is it's a free way to engage in science. And OSIRIS-REx is a project that, that is near and dear to us. We're working with the Dawn mission, and a lot of the people in OSIRIS-REx overlap with the people on the Dawn mission. And as we work with uh, Asteroid Mappers, Dawn, uh, Vesta. Vesta Vesta edition is up now. Uh, we're going to, assuming the funding works, we're going to do the series edition in 2015 when we get there. And we're hoping to keep going and get to work with the Osiris Rex mission in the future. And what we're doing is building a community of amateur astronomers focused on studying asteroids, both observationally with their telescopes and through CosmoQuest on their screens. And together we're building this really dynamic understanding of what it's like out in the asteroid belt that, that's really cool. Um, and it's awesome to know we're going to get to keep working with you on this as well, Peter, because you're one of the people we really enjoy working with. And um, it's fun getting to work with people on the other side of the world with programs like this that are 24 hours in duration, uh, or in this case, 32 hours, but called 24. Um, we got a, a tweet from someone on your side of the planet just a few minutes ago. Um, I'm trying to find it. It's it's from Astrohood. It says, uh, "Keep it up. It's only 4:30 here in Melbourne. Um, I'll be tuning in <laughs> for the next few hours at least." And uh, so this is uh, a note to all of you just now tuning in from the other side of the world. Um, we we need your help getting the world out. We need your help getting our audience numbers to stay up through the wee hours of the morning and we de need your donations. Um, if you're watching that's that right. means you care, <laughs> so give. Um, and that's okay. right, so that's, that's really important, very important. So, so tell us about what you're doing with Regolith there. So, so for, for those not familiar, and, and when I started this, I was unfamiliar with the term regolith, but as I understand it, it's the, the carbonaceous coating around the outside of an asteroid. And, you know, scientists believe that, you know, there are amino acids and things in there that are left over from the formation of the universe and the solar system. Um, and that, um, so this asteroid is going to go up there, it's going to scratch around on the surface and bring um, 60 grams of it back to Earth in 2020 so it's going to take off on in 2016 I think in November um, and so so for example um, I know you and Fraser would have discussed um, ways of defending the earth from asteroid strikes um, let me just go back to my webcam while I'm talking here um, go, go back to, um, you and Fraser have talked in astronomy cast about um, you know what to do with a rogue asteroid or a yeah. at-risk asteroid. Um, and we're going to have you Sandy, know, uh, Sandy from the uh, Arecibo. Arecibo on. I wanted to say VLA, and I knew that was wrong. We're going to have Sandy from Arecibo on to talk about finding about hazardous minutes, asteroids. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's right. And and you would know the story of the Bruce Willis movies and all the bad science and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, with, with um, the, the two prevailing ideas are use a gravity tractor, like a satellite filled with depleted uranium that's really heavy to kind of park beside it and gradually tow it away, or you, you paint it with something that absorbs the energy of the sun, and that changes the rotation. I'll do my Pamela Gay impersonation here of, you know, changes the rotation. <laughs> <laughs> I know you like doing demos on screen. Uh, and. Um, and that will gradually move it out. So it's important for the for the mission controllers that are going to go um, and take this sample. It's important they know what it's made of. So so amateur astronomers um, use one other pocket asteroids like the one QE uh, two that just went past um, 1998 QE two, which we were taking photos this afternoon um, to report in and. That we need this data because as it approaches from one phase angle to the outgoing phase angle, they want the they want to get an idea of the albedo of these carbonaceous asteroids so they can determine what they're made out of. So, you know, at Arecibo we've got the radar and all those kind of good things which can take pictures of it. But it, it's the period and the spin and amateurs can play an important role by gathering lots of data now. 
Banu is out of sight at the moment. It's on the other side of the solar system, so we're not going to get another look at it for at least another 12 months, I think. Um, but ones like QE2 that have just come through, they are carbonaceous type asteroids. So we're able to do some data collection that's a good proxy for what we need to know about Bennu. So does that make sense? It, it makes sense. And, and I'd like to add, understanding the spin is particularly important because mm -hmm. when you're doing a sample return mission, you need to find an asteroid that isn't tumbling too frequently uh, because if it's tumbling too fast, it becomes very hazardous to try and land on it while the walls of craters are that's, rotating towards you. That's right. Yeah. And with, with backyard telescopes, you can actually measure the rotation rate uh, because the, the asteroids, um, depending on whether you're seeing them large sides forward or end forward, uh, they reflect a different amount of light. So you can, you can measure the period of how they vary in brightness to get the period of how they rotate. The rotation yeah. also determines, um, it'll change its uh, orbit by a slight bit, yes. depending on how it's rotating and how the, uh, the uh, radiation pressure yeah. is being distributed. And so that's yeah, something that correct. they've been doing at Arecibo with the radar as well. Yeah, so just, just to finish up on this, because I don't want to dwell on it too long, but uh, the Target Asteroids program is where um, amateurs are working with Carl Hergenrother and Dolores Hill at Arizona University, and we're putting in... Um, um, you know, measurements, uh, uh, photometry and astrometry on these asteroids. And uh, for itelescope.net um, users, um, as being a partner of the program, we can set up an education account that gives a generous discount for telescope time if they're working on, on that project. So, um, and itelescope, I think, as I heard it last, uh, we're getting more, uh, a fair amount of high percentage, I, I won't be, um, there are a lot of other people involved here, so I won't you know, be disrespectful, but we're, we're getting a high percentage of the data coming from us, so it's been quite good. That's really awesome. So now, just let, you, let me just, yeah, sorry. You, you mentioned you have educational yeah. programs with, with iTelescope. Can you tell uh, any educators who might be out in the audience how they can get their classroom students doing these fabulous things that you're talking about? Um, yeah, well, we just had a great example very quickly. Um, a group of um, um, what they call, um, what, um, can't remember the name, Tresame students, so the mid middle school students in France, um, had a very energetic science teacher. They um, took out an education account, which gives them a discount because they're a school and a university. Um, and uh, they, they they wanted to do a, uh, and you can read the story of this on our website at itelescope.net, they wanted to do an exoplanet transit for a science competition in France. And wouldn't you know, the light curve they had, then well, no, no, blew out the rest of the light curve three times in a row. So they were getting frustrated, so they took all the images they did, they ran it through some photometry software and go, what else is in this image? They found two variable stars that were completely unknown to the VSX, and they called up their uh, local astronomer at their local observatory in France and said, and, and I gave them a little bit of coaching on, on what the next steps were. Um, uh, Berend, I think, was the name. I can't remember his first name, but a uh, scientist in France. Uh, he peer-reviewed the discovery paper and submitted it in their science competition. They won their regional science competition through to the national finals. This was the, um, this was the, um, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the school off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, a school in Papignon in France. So they named Pep, Perp 1 and Perp 2 after their town in France, where some 14 year old kids found two variable stars. So that's, that's the kind of thing we can do. And when I work with teachers, I'm always reluctant to sort of like bang down the door and say, oh, here's all this extra stuff. You know, the teachers are going to want to work with you and you've got to run at their pace because, you know, let's face it, teachers are incredibly busy, yeah. hardworking, wonderful, you know, people. I'm married to an English teacher and a teacher of the deaf, so I'm oh. qualified to say that. So, <laughs> And, uh, you know, they've got a fairly hefty workload, but... For those that want to stretch and grow and, and get out into the into doing a bit more, there's plenty that can be done. Right? So 
That's yeah, you're doing some real good with your program out there, and we've we've always been pleased to get to work with you with the stuff that we're doing, and um, yeah. it's it's awesome to so watch. Look, I know I'm I know I'm coming up to time here, so just before we log off, I'm going to do oh, a little bit of a walk. Time still. Yeah, you have yeah, 20, minutes. 20 minutes. You're good. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little walk around here. I'm going to unplug the laptop from my power supply, which is yeah. Can you tell on. us what a laneway is? So, I don't know yeah. the U.S. listeners. Yeah, know. so a laneway now. Have you have you got the video that I sent you? I don't know if you. Got I did. The video. Yes, I saw so that. So in Melbourne, we've got. Um, that. Did, did you might want to play it after I'm finished, and, and you can get a bit of background on the laneway. So so here we've got the laneway. What we've been doing, we've got lots of classes here, where people, these people behind me, are learning how to do, um, learning how to do. Um, there's Tom. We're going to have a chat to Tom in a minute. Tom runs the learning in the laneway. These guys are doing um, origami at the moment. Um, but on this table one hour ago, there were people learning how to program robots. And in a room just down the hall here, there's a bunch of people uh, investigating the science of roller coasters, <laughs> so, which is really amazing. So um, this is who we're talking to. Well, I'm just showing Tom here your photos. Um, so... I'm going to hand it over to Tom, and Tom's going to tell us a little bit about learning in the laneway. Yeah. And you can ask him a couple of questions, perhaps. And uh, Tom's here. He came up with this fantastic idea. And I met Tom through the internet, as you do, and your mother tells you never go and meet strangers you met on the internet, of course. But yep. you know, Tom was running these quirky little courses, and I rang him up, and I said, well, you've never had anyone do an asteroid hunt, I bet. You know, no one's ever done an asteroid hunting course. And he goes, no, we have to have that, you know. So he booked me in for a, a time. But tell us, Tom, just a little bit about learning in the laneway and, and what it means. This is Pamela and Nicole. They're both doctors. I've already told all the doctor, doctor jokes. So they're, they're <laughs> Hi. I'm, I'm going to hang it over. So would you like to ask uh, a question or two, Pamela? Yeah. Hi, Tom. Um, oh. <laughs> I just realized he asked you guys a question, but he didn't have the microphone anymore. So I should tell you, what he, what he said was, do you guys want to ask me a question at all? Sure, oh. sure. We, we, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, what is, yeah, what, so I guess we've got uh, some U.S. Uh, watchers, including myself. What is a laneway and what is learning in the laneway? So l laneway as a, as a piece of vernacular is um, a very Melbourne thing. Uh, the way the, the grid in Melbourne is set out, you have in the CBD, a big street, then a little street, then a big street, then a little street, more or less all the way through the city. Um, and it's the little streets which colloquially are, are, are known as the laneways. Um, and it's something that Melbourne as a city is very proud of because it's actually, I don't know whether they realized it at the time, but it's actually a, a really great structure for a city today. Um, because it means that right in the center of the city where we have skyscrapers and corporate office blocks around, you also have these tiny little laneways which are um, really good as, uh, as a hotbed of um, small community, you know, based businesses, coffee shops, um, independent stores, all that kind of thing. So that kind of culture, the laneway culture, is something that people in Melbourne are you know, very attached to, and it's definitely something that we've, um, at Laneway Learning, have definitely tried to, to tap into. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 I love it. And so what is Learning the Laneway, and what um, what kind of programs do you have there? Cool, so um, Laneway Learning, we started it just over a year ago now, about 15 months, and the basic idea was that we would invite almost anyone who wanted to teach a class in an informal setting uh, with to a group of people um, a way to do that. So we come into cafes and bars in the Melbourne laneways um, on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday evenings when you know maybe they're not as busy as they could be and we encourage them to teach a class in almost anything that they like. So Peter has taught um, asteroid hunting, citizen science classes. Yeah, we've also had beekeeping classes, origami classes, like he said. More or less, we, we say anything and everything, and, you know, we're, we're more or less open open to that. We try and stick to that. That's really cool. We, we need more things like that here in the United States. Yeah. 
Where, whereabouts in the United States are you guys? We're right in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> we're in the metro <laughs> east of the city of St. Louis. So if you know where the Mississippi River is, uh, we're sure. half, halfway up the Mississippi. Um, everyone thinks that because we're in Illinois, we're near Chicago. No, it's five hours away by car. Um, it's a big country, and we live in the empty space right. in the middle of it. It's my first time not living on the coast. It's, it's a bit weird. <laughs> but, but the nice thing is the cost of living is a lot less, mm -hmm. and that actually is part of what allows us to do our programs is uh, when you can buy a house, and you can in this town for $80,000, um, it suddenly starts to become easier to live and easier to do projects and easier to yeah, hire sure. really good staff. Um, that you don't have to pay six figures just because their rent for a thousand square feet is three thousand um, dollars. So part yes, of yeah, how yeah, we're sure. part of how we're able to do CosmoQuest is we're here in the middle of the country, surrounded by corn with the occasional tornado, but there's a lot of really great people, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we do great things. Sure. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah, I've learned a fair bit from from Peter over the last couple of months, and and yeah, it seems amazing what what you guys do. So, yeah, nice work. Can I can I ask? Are those is that are those is that Google Glass it that is. you're wearing on the <laughs> that we're both wearing? Uh, yeah. We just it's, 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 this week. Yeah. How, how is that? <laughs> um. It's oh wow! How exciting. <laughs> It, it was kind of wild. Earlier this evening, um, a group of our guys from the Virtual Star Party uh, somehow got the wrong link, and instead of calling into this Hangout, they were calling into my glasses. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I had all these people trying <laughs> to talk to me on my face. <laughs> my mother likes the fact that her text messages show up in my eyeball. Yeah, I mean it's it's <laughs> we've got a lot of the yeah, private sure. communication about the production happening he, up here as well. <laughs> and and it, it's been really cool because, uh, for instance, Citizen Gold, another one of your down under compatriots, he's over in New Zealand. Uh, he's been tweeting with me this evening, and because he's someone I follow, and he at tweets me, it appears on my Google Glasses, so I can just touch this, check what he had to say. And uh, there's been a few tweets that we've gotten that I've read out loud, and it's nice to not have to look away yeah. from the camera because I feel like I've been spending half this hangout looking away from the camera because of all the technology. Um, so it is one of those things that transforms us from being down here to instead being up here, and that's a nice change. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, that sounds great. I think. Um, I might hang back to to Peter now, but it's lovely to talk to you both. And yeah. thanks for thanks for hosting me just for a few minutes. And thanks for hosting all the science Peter's doing. <laughs> That's quite all right. He's always welcome. Tell him to come back and do another one. We will. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there we go. We're back. Switchy, switchy. Back live. So um, that was Tom. Tom's great. And. Uh, <laughs> We've had a, a very interesting time. So uh, I guess um, can you hear me? Okay. Oh. Yeah, we're we just yeah. fine. Yep. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, I guess this is time for the pitch. So you know the Osiris Rex program we looked at before. You know it relies on citizen science, right? And um, very much so. Citizen science is about leveraging the crowd, engaging people, um, and you know that. Osiris Rex is a fully funded, sponsored mission through NASA, and you know it's bringing citizen science in to help achieve the goals of the mission. But you don't get citizen science if you don't have education and outreach programs. Whereby I've come to meet people like Pamela and, and Nicole, and uh, so. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very important that uh, we, we keep that funding up. And, you know, we, we live in interesting times where, where the um, technology swept through the music industry, it swept through the gambling industry, it swept through a number of different um, things, and it's currently sort of uh, virtual capital, uh, virtu venture capital um, is, is one of the current ones that it's impacting. So, um you know, it, it we are seeing a lot of change, and and it's important that we support and use the crowdfunding, the crowdsourcing, and, and that. But you know, in terms of sequestration, 
obviously, um, we need to plan these things over time and transition gradually. You can't just flick the switch and expect things to happen overnight. So, um, so that's my little pitch towards uh, you guys. You, you're doing a great job, and uh, I'm glad you laughed at my doctor, Doctor Jake. And I, I'm going to go back to my. Um, that's probably why Google maybe thought I was. I was. I was. Um, Paying out on that glass, maybe that's why I got bumped off before. <laughs> They're watching <laughs> so <I'm> you. <laughs> so, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been great to bring you some science from the laneways of Melbourne today. Um, it was just quite coincidental that this was on the Sunday Spectacular was on at the same time as your um, as yours. So I thought we'd try and bring the two together in a you know, bit of a first for, for you guys and. Um, have you got have you got the video that I did yeah, off the lane? Yeah, I have done? that all and queued up. Maybe um, we can use that as an outro, and yep. um, and we can uh, share that with the folks, and and uh, we'll wish you all the best, and hope you get lots of caffeine and uh, manage to go the full thirty-two hours. And uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on board. Thank oh, you, Peter. always. Thank you so much, and. Uh, Keep spreading the science and engaging everyone that comes near you. It's, it's one thing I can count on you to always do is to inflict science on others. <laughs> you make it sound so painful. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. We're going to switch over to video now. So, hi. We're going to play that. Uh, I'm going to mute ourselves so it doesn't play out. Yeah, folks, <laughs> the autumn leaves are dropping and it's a misty, wet day in Melbourne, one of the most livable cities in the world. Today we're coming to you live from the Moon World Cafe in one of Melbourne's famous laneways. Laneways of Melbourne are the Epicurean heart with little cafes dotted around. But this Sunday, science is coming to the laneway. We'll be doing a real live asteroid hunt. Goddard Space Center and Arizona University. We'll also be looking at some of the latest tools that citizen science can get involved in. And we'll be doing a live cross to Dr. Pamela Gay from Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. And we'll be participating in the 24 hour CosmoQuest Hangout a thon, which will cross here live for some of our citizen science. Sorry, just love so there you go, folks. Thanks. Thank and you. Uh, I hope you have a great day and great all night. <laughs> <laughs> all the greats. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, keep inflicting the science. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you. Good night. Yay.